Good morning, everyone. Let us pray. Come, Holy Spirit, you who, are, who, you who are already here, imbued us with your eternal presence and quickness, with your determination to transform us. May the words of my mouth, the meditation of our hearts, be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Amen. Can you be seated, please? I want to thank very much um, your rector, the very Reverend Claire Nevins Field, for our ministry and to identify with her in a not, not a really a good way. And that is that we both had COVID. I had it three times. 2022, before I went to Lambeth, 2023, before I went on my sabbatical. In fact, 2023, October. And 2020, no, yeah. And then I had 2023, July, before I went on my sabbatical. I tell you what, to those who have had it, we know the story. We know how tough it is. And it has, what it's done for me, it has taken away my speech because I had a terrible antiviral condition, a lot of mucus, Coughing, or not, you could think it. And so it has really affected the way I speak, the way I'm able to focus. And it does something to your mental capacity. You know, your clarity of thinking is, is impaired to a lesser extent. You're not the same again if you've had that in a, over an extended period of time. So my friend Claire, I'm walking with you in this long COVID. And, and to all of you, thank you for walking with your rector in this journey. It take about a year, she says, and I've been at it for two years. But you'll get be better, you'll be all right. My greatest concern for her and myself was my heart. Because it does something to your heart. And, I, and as you all know, I had a very serious heart heart issue in, in June of 17. And so I was always anxious about would my heart sustain all of this drama? And thank God for the good Lord, it, it has been able to, to, to keep me alive. And so I know you are having some care on that part. Stick with it, it works. I'm here because of, of that same care from the wonderful medical team um, that looks out for you and cares for you and does things that are normally not done by the ordinary man and the person in the pew or anyone else. And so encourage your rector, watch over her, take care of her. This too shall pass. Nothing is permanent. This too shall pass. And so the care you give her now will ensure that you get her for life at least until she retires. Not for life. <laughs> but what it does, it speaks to the caliber of a people. It speaks to the, the care of people for their rector. It more than just, um, okay, you'll be all right. It, it speaks to your character, your care, for your rector or for anyone else who may fall ill and carry an illness that, that they didn't determine or design, but some of the other got to them. And the care we give to them tells the world how much we know how to love people, to care for them. Thank you, Reverend Claire, for your ministry. You'll be all right, by God's grace, trust me. And thank you very much for taking care of her. In, in 1989, God called my wife and I and our two children, Ingram and Amanda, to leave our home country, Guyana, in South America, to journey to the Bahamas to respond to a call, an invitation by the Bishop of the Bahamas the Right Reverend Michael Eldon, to be part of his, the clergy contingent there. So 
So my wife and I left our home country with four suitcases, four, four cartoon boxes, because that was all our possession. And by the time we get to the airport in Nassau, Bahamas, the pots and pans had been running, had, had broken out of the cartoon boxes and was rolling on the floor of the airport custom section. Bang, 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 bang. Ingram, run, run, look the pot going there, run, run. My poor little son, six years old, little daughter, three year old. And that began our journey <laughs> in, a, in another country. Because when you're faithful to God, you do some strange things that ordinary people would not do. You leave home, kin, siblings, and you travel to an unknown destination that no one knows, neither yourself, what might be in store for you. It's called vulnerability, where you take your faith literally in the palm of your hand and say, Lord, do with me what you wish to do. And then fast forward, in 2003, the good Lord spoke again and said to me, it's time to move on from the Bahamas because you have done what you, I called you to do here. And believe me, in the Bahamas, I, I built a brand new church, debt free. I built a 5,600 square foot disaster, natural disaster center for a community for $150,000. That's worth over $2 million. I revived all of the churches I went to. I took a church from 60 members and one, one Sunday school child in four years to 250 and 80 children. 40 of them were acolytes in Inagua of 1,200 people, way down in the south, the last island of the Bahamas. And then God said, okay, you've done enough nonsense. I need you to do some more nonsense. So in 20, 2003, we were invited to Jacksonville, Florida, to be rector of a parish in the Diocese of Florida in Jacksonville. And from there, God said, okay, I need you to go to Seychelles in the Indian Ocean to be their bishop, because I need you to go lead the diocese that was dying and in trouble back to health and wellness. In 2009, 8, it came back to health and wellness, and God said, it's time for you to go back home. So I left the Seychelles in October of 2008, came back to Florida, and did not work for one year. Had no job, no income, but the grace of God. My wife and I, we survived with our two children in, in university with nothing but the grace of God. And then, in 2009, we were invited to go to East Carolina by Bishop Dan Daniels to be the assistant bishop in the Diocese of East Carolina up on the west eastern shore of North Carolina. We spent three years there, did some great work, and then we were invited to come to Alabama to be the assistant bishop to Bishop Keith Sloan, who preached at my investiture, you remember? And, and in all of that, I was always troubled by what is God doing to my life? There's no stability. There's all this movement is having an effect on me. And then I wonder if I were escaping or God meant something about it. Until I read, I love to read the spiritual writers. I read Basil of, 
of Jerusalem one or two Basel brothers, one of Bishop Caesarea, one of Bishop Beth Jerusalem. And he was wondering why would God want him to leave his country in Caesarea and go to Jerusalem? What was God doing it that far? And then he read the psalm, Psalm 24, that says, the earth is the Lord and all things thereof. And then he got it. Oh, it's not about where God is taking. It's that God owns the world. And you may think that it's movement. No, it's another place that God is landing you to do God's work. Because mission, hear me now, mission means movement. When you call to mission, you're called to encounter movement, to move from one place to the next, as God would design it so to be. So it gave me some satisfaction to know, when I read Basel of, of Jerusalem, oh my gosh, I got the answer. It's good to read the saints, because you get a lot of insight into your own encounter, and you make sense of what's happening to your life. And from then, I never questioned God. So when you read, when I read today about Abraham and Abraham's journey, you see why I think about my own? That each journey is a confusion. It's a wonderment. Each journey is scary. It's vulnerable. You're leaving your own confined, your custom surrounding, and you're journeying to a place where you don't know anybody, you don't know the place, you don't, know, they don't, you don't speak like them, you don't act like them, you don't think like them, and you wonder if you'd ever, if you'd ever, be, if you'd ever fit in, and if you'd ever be welcome or, in, or, or, or be accommodated. So these are the certain types of, of uncertainty you encounter when you move, as Abraham is doing. Abraham was 75 years old. That's a, how many, I'm not 75, I'm 67. I'm not far from near Abraham, right? And asked to leave his country, Haram, and go to a place that God was calling him to go, Canaan. He took Leah, I'm sorry, he took Sarah, he took Lot, his brother Charles, Laban, and his stocks and livestock, all that he owned. Unfortunately, it was not four boxes and four suitcases. It was lots of possessions. But nevertheless, he journeyed to the unknown place. And guess what? When he got to the place, somebody was staying there in the house. The Canaanites who were living there were occupying the land. You're going to give me a land that's been occupied? What are you talking about, God? You've got to be kidding. All he could do was he built an altar at Shechem the Oak of Mamre, and he praised God. Wonderful. He praised God for leading him from Haram over that long journey across the desert to the place of the promised land. But yet, he could not stay there because the land was occupied by, the, by its original inhabitants. But then he ended up in Egypt if you read a lesson, and guess what? There were some scoundrels who were eyeing his wife, Sarah. Abraham said to say, you know, Sarah, if you tell them that you are, I'm your husband, they'll kill me. Tell them that you're my sister. I'm your, I'm your brother. He lied. He lied. Sarah lied to save Abraham's life in Egypt. You need to understand what people have to do and what they have to encounter when they move from place to place. 
what they go through, the names they are called, the ideal and the threats that they face. You have to appreciate these things that happen to a person's life when they have faith that calls them to a place that God is summoning them to because God seen them, the individual God wishes to transform the place. They do not go through, go through easy stuff. Nothing is cut and dried. Everything is uncertain. Everything is in the ether. And I need you to understand all of this drama that's going on in Abraham's life. And to understand, like Abraham, people like me who move from place to place to serve God, the drama we go through and the uncertainty we go through and what we have to put up with in order to, go, to do God's work. The names we are called, we have to lie to save our lives. God says, if your faith is small as a mustard seed in the gospel, do you know, what, do you know the size of a mustard seed? Lynn and I, when we were in, the Baha, in, in Alabama, sorry, we, we ran the whole of the summer in Alabama is Camp, Camp McDowell summer where there's several weeks of, of um, camp in different phases. Lynn and I ran the, the last, last camp, which is for the kindergarten children from age five to age 10. They came with their parents and we ran the camp. We were directors of that camp. We closed the session. And um, one of the sessions the counselors were, were doing something called mustard seed lesson, where they got mustard seed bought from the store and they gave it to the kids when they came into the class as a, as, as a kind of give them some context. And when the mustard seed fell on the ground, nobody could pick them up. They were so small. Nobody could pick, not even the smallest child could step stoop down and pick up one of those mustard seeds. It's amazing how small a mustard seed is. And Jesus uses the smallest of seeds to tell a miraculous story. That when you put it in the ground, it is the smallest of seeds. But yet when it grows, it grows into a large, an enormous tree where the birds of the air sat in their branches, taking shade. It's a, it's a meta, it is a metaphor for telling us that faith, like Abraham's faith, is a very, very small thing. But when you live into it, when you practice it, when you grow through all the machinations about faith, living out your faith, you come out to be a better person, that your life becomes a wisdom for others to see. Like the birds of the air take shade in its branches, it's saying to us that when we have wisdom, when we grow up in faith and we've gone through life and we develop an enormous amount of wisdom, a repertoire of wisdom, we can now share with other people wise saying. We can give them counsel so that they don't make the mistakes that you would have made on account of learning your, 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 your life. That's what the mustard seed is all about. It's about saying to adults, you, you've gone through the crisis of, of aging, now use your wisdom to share it with other people. Don't hold it. Be responsible. Be caring. Don't put it under a bush, but let it speak for other people to see. So those of us who think that, well, we, we, have, we have been through this life for 80 years old, and I'm not going to tell anybody anything, I'm, you're wrong. I think we are doing the world an injustice. We are hoarding information that the world needs so it could be a better place, that our young people need so they can grow up to be not, they grow up in order not to make the mistakes that we made when we were young. My beloved, your faith is the substance of what makes you a better person. And that faith, as it matures over time, generates a lot of experience and wisdom 
And in that generation, you have a repertoire of information to share to the rest of the world. Because why? You walk the walk. You understand the pain. You know the vulnerable, 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 my tongue is getting tired. The vulnerability in all of it. And you also know that it will be better. You'll get better. It gets better and better. I am a better person. I believe my wife is a better person because we have traveled the world and seen ministry. That's why I find that when I talk about church and God mighty act, many people don't understand what the heck he's talking about. God can't do that. I remember my first, and I'm going to end now, but I share this. My first week in this diocese, I was in my office in Easton. And someone came to me and said, we called you to close this diocese. God above me. I'm not going to lie. I said, what? I said, I did not see that in the profile. <laughs> if I'd seen that, I wouldn't have come. I was, I was, a, I was a bishop already for 12 years when I came here. You know how, how many years I was a bishop? 12 years. I didn't need to be made a bishop. I've worked at the Anglican Community Office for six years. I've been all over the world. By the time I came here, I've seen the world. I don't want to be a bishop. I'm a bishop already. So I said to, I said to brother, you haven't seen my Jesus for a kid. You haven't seen my Jesus take nothing and turn it into something. I have seen Jesus work. I've seen how Jesus has transformed the world, transformed churches, transformed people. I didn't come in to close no diocese. I came to re-energize this diocese, to bring resurrection to this diocese. Did you read the last article in the Living Church? Huh? Weren't you proud? Weren't you proud that your diocese was featured in a positive light in the one of the world's global magazines? I was very proud. I didn't write it. Trust me. I leave it for other people to do it. And all they needed was 1,000 words they needed. My beloved, that's the transformative love of God. So believe me, I didn't come to close this diocese as I, as I was told. I came to give this diocese for God to use me to lead you to a better place and a far more rewarding diocese. So much so that the world would read about your diocese in a living church magazine. Because the article, and it was sent to all of you through the e-news, the article is very much there for the world to read and to learn that Easton is a vibrant little diocese doing marvelous work for God's kingdom. Amen.